exchange cynicism or the hardships of life. Whoever said life was fair. Money is abstraction in action. To hell with value, business is business. For money, nothing matters. It is the medium in which the equating of what is different is realised in practical terms. Like nothing else, it has the power to bring different things to a common denominator. Just as newspaper print and television screens are indifferent to the contents they transmit, money preserves its unshakable indifference with respect to all goods for which it can be exchanged, no matter how different. The Roman Emperor Vespasian sniffed a coin as if he suspected that it must stink and remarked, ironically, non olet. Modern bourgeois economic sciences are basically nothing other than a higher level, non olet. In the song of praise to the free market economy, modernised money, as capital, is found in appropriately modern form to declare its physical and moral odourlessness. For as long as nothing other than purely economic acts of exchange stand to debate, scarcely a single philosopher, and still less an economist, thought of checking out the phenomenon of money with regard to its cynical valences. In its theory, the capitalist commodity economy unrelentingly confirms its good reputation. Is it not based on the best possible of all morals, the just price and the free contract? Wherever private wealth emerges, there is always someone around who assures us that he has earned it in the most moral way, by his own sweat. Only out of resentment could anyone want to find fault with good businessmen. Of course, the non-elect party and its intelligent representatives has accepted responsibility for certain moral complications of the commodity and money economy. With regard to spending money, some dubious manifestations must be obvious even to the defender of the existing relations. Georg Simmel is probably the first, was probably the first to investigate explicitly the problem of cynicism that arises with money. For if money, as we say, has buying power, how far can this buying power extend itself? If money confronts a commodity that has been produced for the market, it is naturally the price that determines whether the commodity changes hands to the money possessor. This remains a purely economic calculation of value. Simmel can come to speak of exchange procedures in which money exchanges against values not known to count as commodities. The philosophy of money reveals the phenomenon of cynicism and the fact that it seems to be an inherent power of money to entangle and exchange deals, goods that are not commodities, as if they were such. It is the obvious venality of everything and everybody that, in capitalist society, instigates a gradual but continually deepening process of cynical corruption. Here, the more money becomes the sole centre of interests. The more we see honour and conviction, talent and virtue, beauty and health of the soul mobilised on its behalf, all the more will a mocking and frivolous mood arise regarding these higher goods of life, which are offered for sale for the same kind of value, vert quala, as goods on the weekly market. The concept of market price for values, which in their essence refuse every valuation except that in their own categories and ideals, is the completed objectification of what cynicism represents as subjective reflex. That quote from Philosophy des Gelds, 4th edition, Munich, 1912, page 264. The cynical function of money reveals itself in its power to entangle higher values in dirty deals. One rightly hesitates to treat this under the concept of buying power. Wherever economic money value shows itself to be in a position to draw extra economic values, honour, virtue, beauty, says Simmel, into business, there, in addition to the power of buying, a second power of money comes to the fore that is only analogous, not identical with the first. It is the power of seduction. It exercises its power on those whose wishes, needs and life plans have assumed the form of venalities. 
and in capitalist culture that is more or less everyone. Only in a situation of universal seduction, in which, moreover, those who are seduced have long regarded the word corruption as morally overstrained, can Simmel's frivolous mood regarding the higher goods of life, from now on so-called higher goods of life, become a cultural climate. This climate is nothing other than what we described at the beginning as universal diffuse cynicism. Caricatures. Everything has its price, particularly that which is priceless. The speech balloon rises out of the mouth of a big financier of the fin de cycle who dines on his private compartment, his coat unbuttoned, cigar in his hand, on his knees two naked ladies from good society. Counterpart, American billionaire on a tour of Europe as intimidated Europeans may have imagined him during the twenties. Well, boys, I'll be blowed if for a couple of dollars we couldn't pack up the old continent into our suitcases. An extra check for what these deep German ecstatic thinkers call cool tour. And to top it off, we'll sign up the Pope as well. Such buy-up phrases caricature the breaking through of the material sphere of values into the ideal sphere of values. Capital irresistibly corrupts all values bound to the older forms of living whether by buying them as decorations and means of enjoyment, or by causing them to disappear as obstacles. This constitutes the dialectic of antiquities. Old stuff survives if it can be capitalised, and it can be capitalised only by virtue of the dynamics of modernisation and ageing specific to capitalism. Here, capitalist society inevitably comes up against its fundamental cynical dynamic regarding values. It is in its nature to continually expand the zone of venalities. <clears throat> in this way it produces not only an abundance of cynicisms, but also, as moral encore to these, its own outrage against them. In accordance with its ideological optics, it can only conceive of money cynicism as a market phenomenon. Without effort, neo-moralistic and neo-conservative phraseologies here find their accusing examples. The capitalist form of economy is compatible with nothing quite so much as the humanistic lamentations about the corrupting effect of almighty money on ethics and customs. Money makes the world go round, isn't that terrible? The non-Olet party must therefore also concede a certain odour of disreputability. However, it does everything it can to trace cynicism in the use of money back to the seducibility of individuals. The flesh is weak where money is willing. Things can always be presented as if the disreputable actors were responsible for shady acts of exchange. Once their principal accountability is assured, it is not hard to concede certain marginal moral problems. These are unfortunately inherent to the market. Seduction in the sense of the channeling of needs indeed, belongs to its fundamental principles. Insofar as a cynical function of money is noticed, it remains strictly limited to the domain of exchange and consumption, in which, as they say, secondary disreputabilities cannot always be avoided. Or, well, however, who would want to deny the advantages of the system? In order not to have to speak of cynicism, sociologists like to tinker with theories of modernization that jovially enter the change of values in the progress account. If we listen closely, we cannot avoid noticing that Simmel has a particular form of venality of higher values in mind. Naturally, here we are talking about the honor, virtue, beauty, and spiritual welfare of woman. Such things can also be bought. Prostitution, in the narrower and broader sense, is the core of exchange cynicisms in which money, in its brutal indifference, also drags a higher order goods down to its level. In no other area does the cynical potency of money come so glaringly to the fore as there, where it bursts sheltered regions feelings, love, self-esteem, and induces people to sell themselves to an alien interest. Wherever hussies carry their genitals to market, 
There, Capital is confronted from the outside with something about which, deep inside, it does not want to know anything. In a certain respect, it is a shame that Marx, in his famous commodity analysis, did not proceed from prostitution and its particular form of exchange. Such an approach would certainly have offered theoretical advantages. As head of the Olet party, he would have to be interested in every opportunity to demonstrate the cynicism of money. The woman as commodity would have been a truly irrefutable argument. But a book that intends to become the bible of the workers' movement cannot begin with a theory of prostitution. Marx thus initially tries to explain the secret of equivalent exchange with completely irreproachable products such as wheat and iron, coats and linen, silk and shoe polish. We follow his subtle analysis and its decisive steps. Commodity and commodity. Commodity and money. Money and commodity. Transition from money as money to money as capital. Here, in the middle of these idyllic, formal considerations of equivalence, those dull tensions reveal themselves for the first time that hint at a source of contradiction at the core of the entire system of exchange. All at once, money, by way of the detour through commodity and back to the money form, now becomes more money. Where does it come from? According to the assumptions, equal value is exchanged for equal value, and it augments itself this way. Is the economy a magical variety show? Marx, however, and this much is certain, has described nothing other than the basic form, Grundform, of all circuits of capital that, without exception, rest on the expectations of augmentation. The common people, too, know that money only begets money. In expressions of non olet rhetoric, it is even said that money works. In observing this wondrous augmentation of capital on the commodity market, Marx behaves like a total spoil sport. He does not rest until he has explained the augmentation mechanism from first principles. To the present day, capitalist society has not forgiven him for this. But it does not do the moral and even more the intellectual integrity of a society any good when it has to live chronically against the truths that have long since been formulated about it without being allowed to accept them. I think that Marx's reticence regarding the phenomenon of prostitution has a deeper ground. As a genuine theoretical fundamentalist, he is interested not so much in the easily detectable olet on the market as in the ideologically concealed olet in the sphere of labour. His power of thinking is stimulated not by the cynical stench of circulation, but by the mode of production itself. The latter stimulates the theoretical organ in a way quite different from the former, which directs itself more to the senses. For this reason, the socially critical modern arts have turned towards it the colourfully corrupt manifestations of circulation cynicism. Marx, by contrast, breaks into the innermost positions of the non olet party and smells on capital itself the unmistakable odour of surplus value robbery. The contested theory of surplus value never would have been able to achieve the key strategic position it has won in the Marxist attack on the capitalist social order if it were merely one arbitrary economic formula among others. In fact, it constitutes not only an analytic description of the mechanism of capital augmentation, but at the same time, in a politically explosive way, a diagnosis of the moral relationship of the labouring class to the profiteering class. In the exchange of labour power for wages, the harmony of the equivalence principle appears to be destroyed once and for all. At the innermost core of the capitalist paradise of equivalence, Marx finds the snake wrapped around the tree of knowledge, hissing, When you comprehend how one can systematically take more than one gives, you will become like capital and forget what good and evil are. Since labour creates much more value than is given, quote-unquote, back to the labours in the form of wages, the wage level always moves along the line of the historically relative existence minima, Significant surpluses accumulate in the hands of the possessor of capital. 
The term exploitation poignantly designates the scandal of unfair advantage included in surplus, surplus value production. It contains an epistemological peculiarity, namely it is simultaneously an analytic and a moral agitational expression. As such, it has played a significant role in the historical workers' movements. That the side of capital rejected this battle concept from the start because of its subversive undertones is self-evident. The ideological struggles of the conversations between labour and capital have in fact concentrated on the question of how the phenomena of entrepreneurial profit and exploitation, or rather so-called exploitation, should be interpreted, oletistically, or non-oletistically. Whereas the oletists talk of problems such as poverty, proletarian misery, oppression, immiseration, non-oletists draw attention to economic aggregate interests, reinvestments, social achievements of the economy, securing of jobs and the like. Thus, modern non-oletism is a single great ideological effort at decriminalising surplus value robbery. The Marxian thrust into the moral economic complications of surplus value thus shifts the point of attack to the mode of production itself. In this way it outdoes every possible verdict on cynical outgrowths of the use of money on the market. The real problem is not that, as one says, women of honour and men of their word can be made weak with money. Rather the scandal begins where money as capital systematically presupposes for its functioning the weakness of men and women who have to carry themselves to market. This is the functional immoral basis of the industrial exchange economy. It always reckons with the needy positions of the weaker in its calculations. It erects its continual profit circuit on the existence of large groups that have scarcely any other choice than to like it or lump it. The capitalist economic order rests on the extortability of those who always live in actual or virtual exceptional circumstances. That is, of people who will go hungry tomorrow if they do not work today and will get no work tomorrow if they do not accept what is exacted of them today. Marx does not seek the cynicism of unequal exchange where it can be trivialised as an outgrowth, but rather where as principle it bears the entire structure of production. After Marx, therefore, money and capitalism can never stop stinking of the labour, labourer's misery. In comparison to this, turning the cultural superstructure into a brothel is only a secondary process. The decadence theories of the left describe this pointedly. The great discovery of Marxian political economy, however, consists in the fact that it deciphers the moral political element in the economic element. Domination establishes itself through the wage exchange. Marx exposes how the free labour contract between the labourer and the entrepreneur includes elements of coercion, extortion and exploitation. It is funny that since the labour force has become syndicated, entrepreneurs complain that they are really the ones being extorted. In the interest of self-preservation, those who... Excuse me. In the interest... <coughs> It is funny that since the labour force has become syndicated, entrepreneurs complain that they are really the ones being extorted. In the interest of self-preservation, those who have nothing to offer but labour power subject themselves to the profit interest of the other side. With this arch-realistic expan expansion of the field of view, Marx's analysis raises itself from a merely positive theory of the economic domain of objects to a critical theory of society. Whereas with regard to the circulation and consumption sphere, the cynicisms of capital present itself as a form of seduction, in the production sphere it appears as a form of rape. Just as money as a means of payment lures the higher values into prostitution, money as capital rapes labour power in the production of goods. 
In all these transactions, the demand for a real equivalence of the goods exchanged proves itself to be illusory. Acts of exchange that come about under the pressure of seduction and rape make futile every attempt to construct equal values between the goods. The capitalist system of exchange remains more a system of pressure than a value system. Extortion and rape, even in the non-coercive form of coercion in which contracts are accepted for lack of alternatives, write the real history of the economy. With a realism unpardonable from a bourgeois perspective, Marx describes capitalism in a way that takes the ground from under the feet of all mere economic theories. One cannot speak seriously about labour if one is not prepared to speak about extortion, domination, polemic and war. In investigating surplus value productions, we find ourselves already in the domain of the universal polemic. In order to take the polemical realism of his analysis to the limit, Marx could have even spoken of the struggle value of a commodity instead of its exchange value. This is revealed in particular, of course, with the commodity producing commodities, the means of production in the narrower sense, which always also represent means of struggle and pressure for their possessor. Moreover, it is also shown with the strategic main goods of economies such as wheat, iron, etc. One only has to think of the apparently harmless examples in the commodity analysis in Volume 1 of Capital, to say nothing of the military weapon commodities and commodity weapons. Due to their functional relatedness, weapons and commodities are frequently interchangeable. So, seduction and rape are supposed to be the two modi of capitalist cynicism? Circulation cynicism here, production cynicism there? Here the selling out of values, there the arbitrary pulping of the living time and labour power of the masses for the sake of blind accumulations? A moral overstraining is noticeable in these formulations, no matter how deftly aimed they may be. Whoever stresses the importance of encountering reality with as few illusions as possible may not cite it before an idealistic court even when it is amoral. The moral paradox of capitalism is, in addition, the peculiar tolerability of the intolerable, comfort and devastation, and high life and permanent catastrophe. Capitalism has long since swallowed up its critics especially since it can be certain of the failure of all alternatives initiated by revolutions. Quoting Martin Walser from the Buchner Prize speech in 1981, Whenever it has to be pointed out to capitalism that it cannot help the world, it, in turn, can point out that communism cannot even help itself. Does what has been described here as capital cynicism in the last analysis mean nothing other than the final historical pupation of the experience that, since time immemorial, human life has been exposed to a lot of hardships and cruelties? Is this the existence of human beings on a bloody globe at all subject to moral criteria? Does not the cynicism possibly present to us the most recent form of what the friendly pessimist Sigmund Freud called the reality principle? And accordingly, would an explicitly cynical consciousness not be simply the form of adulthood, complying with a modern world torn more than ever by, to by power struggles, which undisheartedly hardens itself enough to cope with the given relations? Those who speak of the hardships of life land almost automatically in a realm beyond moral and economic reason. What in the physical world is the law of gravity? appears in the moral world as the law that the survival of societies always demands its sacrifices. Every survival demands to be paid for, and it exacts a price that no merely moral consciousness can approve of, and no merely economic calculation can compute. The labouring and struggling groups in human society must experience the price of survival as such a bitter tribute to the reality principle because they pay it with their own blood, sweat and tears. They scrape it together in the form of subjugations to higher forces and facticities. They bear it in the forms of pains, accommodations, privations and hardening self-limitations. 
They continually pay this price in living currency that cuts into the flesh. In the struggle for survival, calluses, wounds and losses are well-known phenomena. Indeed, where a struggle is waged, the strugglers cannot help but make themselves, with their own existence, into a means and weapon of survival. The price of survival is always paid with life itself. Life sacrifices itself everywhere to the conditions of its preservation. Everywhere we look it bends to the coercion, to toil. In class societies, <coughs> in class societies, it subjugates itself to the given relations of domination and exploitation. In militarized societies, it hardens under the compulsion of armament and war. What common sense calls the hardships of life is deciphered by philosophical analysis as self-reification. In obedience to the reality principle, the living being internalizes the external harshness. Thus, it itself becomes the tool of tools and the weapon of weapons. Those who are lucky enough in a generally hard world to live in a niche in which even self de hardenings are possible, must of necessity look with horror outside to the worlds of reification and objective cruelty. The perception of those develop the perception of these develops most sensitively in those who stand between social worlds of varying degrees of hardness and who want to work their way out of the more strongly reified and alienated world into the milder zone. These people come ineluctably into conflict with a reality principle that requires greater self-hardenings from them than would be necessary in the mild zone. They get caught in a front against the versions of the reality principle that demand nothing but sacrifice and hardening from individuals. That is the dialectic of privilege. The privileged person who does not become cynical must wish for a world in which the advantages of softening can be enjoyed by the greatest possible number of people. To bring the reality principle itself into movement is the deepest characteristic of progressivity. Those who know the dessoir de vivre become witnesses against the necessity of the hardships in life that always reproduce the hardened ones anew. Thus, real conservatives can be recognised above all by the fact that they have a horror of the de-hardening of people and their conditions of life. The neoconservatives of today fear that we could become too delicate for a nuclear war. They seek a dialogue with the young, whom they suspect of being possibly already too flabby for the distribution brawls of tomorrow. In the descent to the deepest layers of the reality principle we discover compulsions to subjugate oneself, to labour, to exchange and to arm that have imposed themselves on societies in various historical forms. Even exchange, which bourgeois thinking imagines as one of its models of freedom is rooted more deeply in coercion than in freedom, and this since ages past. Long before we can properly speak of cynicism we encounter an archaic exogamous group that long before we can properly speak of cynicism we encounter in, in archaic exogamous groups the use of women of childbearing age as a living means of circulation the principle of equivalence inserts itself in human cultural history in a way that shocks us as childbearing means of production women are traded like cattle for goods and cattle. However, this exchange does not so much serve the acquisition of herds and riches by the group that exchanges the woman. Mostly the establishment of kinship relations among the dispersed tribes retain its functional priority. Already in the first economy, a politics of survival and pacification manifests itself. The transformation of women into exchange objects contains an embryonic political economy, if you like tribal foreign politics. Well, before any value calculation, archaic groups in this way pay the price for the conditions of survival. Modernity distinguishes itself from a macro-historical perspective, among other things by the way in which it becomes increasingly unclear how societies can sensibly scrape together the price of survival. The hardships they subject themselves to today in the interest of self-preservation, 
in the meantime, possess such a fatal inner dynamic that they work towards self-annihilation rather than towards security. How can that be? A degradation of the reality principle in the modern world has to be diagnosed. As yet, no new modus has been worked out for societies under today's exchange to sensibly secure an economy of survival. For not only is the era of the exchange of women long past, but the succeeding survival economy is also approaching an absolute limit. I call it the economy of the militaristic age. This corresponds to the class societies of Marxist historiography, but the perspective is different. This age is characterised by the fact that in it, by means of enormous amounts of surplus value from the labour of slaves, serfs, or wage labourers, or from taxes, military aristocratic strata, or standing armies, are supported in the classical sense of the word parasitic. They represent non-labouring groups. They have instead the task of securing the living space of their aggregate group. The last millennia belong to the interactions of competing military parasitisms. In this economy, a new price for survival is established. The survival of the whole is paid for with the subjugation of the masses under political military structures and with the readiness of the peoples to read surplus value robbery and tax extortion as the handwriting in which harsh reality communicates its intentions to them. The violence of wars translated itself into a realism that acknowledges the fact of war as a higher power. The necessity of thinking in terms of war in the last millennia constituted the indissoluble core of a tragic positivism. The latter knows, before any philosophy, that we do not primarily have to interpret or change the world, but endure it. War is the backbone of the conventional reality principle, with all its burdening consequences for the construction of social institutions, it represents the innermost, most bitter core of experience of life in class societies. During the age of feudalism and nation states, a society that could not defend itself was doomed to perish or to be conquered. Without a military protective blanket, none of the groups that have been powerful in history could have survived. The direct transmission of surplus values to military aristocratic strata, ruling class, is characteristic of feudal societies, but nowhere to date has the modern world that developed out of the bourgeois revolution against feudalism been able to decisively overcome this transmission process. Everything it has achieved in this point exhausts itself in the transformation of direct surplus value transmission into an indirect transmission. Instead of the direct exploitation of the people by a stratum of nobles and a soldiery maintained by them, we now have modern people's armies run by professional soldiers and financed with the aid of taxes. But it is precisely here that the modern state, as bearer of society's military protective blanket, increasingly conducts its task ab absurdum. For in the age of the total war, of universal military service and nuclear strategy, the military apparatuses of the major states are no longer protective shells for social life, but develop day by day more clearly into the greatest source of danger for survival in any form. Because it has become possible to annihilate without trace whole societies through blanket bombardments, and the effacement of every difference between combatants and non-combatants, i.e. between troops and the civilian population, the modern states, which call themselves democratic or socialist, play with the lives of their populations in a way that not even the most brutal of feudal systems would have been able to do. If, in fact, the transfer of surplus value from the working populations to the political military apparatus were the price we had to pay for our survival, then even today, in the last instance, it would still have to be scraped together with the gnashing of teeth. In reality, this does not work. Vast sums of surplus value are pumped into political military structures that incessantly entangle themselves in more and more risky mutual threatening. Today, therefore, working means, whether we like it or not, supporting a system that in the long run can by no means be the system of our survival. For a long time now, we have not been paying a price for our survival, 
but rather creating surplus value for a suicide machine. And this I see a disaster for our traditional concept of reality and rationality. With a thousand voices, this disaster is answered by the rampant irrationalism in the Western superstructure. Total social irrationality has reached a level that not only leaves the explanatory power of individual intellects behind, but even conjures up the question whether the world's centres of action can at all still muster enough rational energy to overcome the irrationality that is active within them. Everything that today would have the power to loosen the knot is itself part of the knot. What today is called rationality is comprised down to its deepest layers by the fact that it reveals itself to be a form of thinking of the principle of self-preservation gone wild. The face of the last great attempt, publicly announced as rational, to break up the deep layers of social irrationality is cause for dismay. In the attempt to disentangle the contradictions of the capitalist system with the aid of the Marxist dialectic, the knot not only did not loosen, but became twisted to the point of total absurdity. See the section on the Grand Inquisitor, chapter 7, and the second sectors, sections of chapters 8 and 11. In the wrangle of the great powers, the Marxist faction, which had undertaken to solve the problems of capitalism, had possibly even become the more hopeless part of the problem. If we look for the reasons for this, it becomes clear how fatefully and illusionistically the moralising aspect of the surplus value theory has outflanked its analytic aspect. For what this theory works out as the objective perfidy of the capitalist robbery of time from the labouring masses is, at the same time, a description of what happens in all societies with political military superstructures. Even if they all call themselves socialist a thousand times. The channeling of surplus value into armaments is more likely to flourish even better when the complete state ownership of productive property, as the Russian example shows. Do not the Marxist theories of revolution rest on a tragic misinterpretation of the theory of surplus value? The latter, according to its strategic intent, was essentially the attempt to formulate an objective, i.e. quantitative language, in which a moral social relation, exploitation, was to be treated. It wants to develop the concept of exploitation in a computable way, so as to show that this exploitation cannot go on forever. But the problem of exploitation basically cannot be located on the level of quantitative considerations. Who wants to calculate what people are prepared to put up with? There is no mathematics that can be used to calculate how long the thread of patience will hold out. And there is no arithmetic of self-consciousness. For thousands of years, people in military and class societies have been trained through toughening and education to allow surplus value to be squeezed out of them under the pressure of domination. And the people on the infinite expanses of today's Russian agrarian archipelagos are scarcely any different from the slaves and fellaheen of antiquity. This demands not so much a theory of surplus value as an analysis of voluntary servitude. The problem of exploitation touches more on political psychology than on political economy. Resignation is stronger than revolution. What could be said about the damned of the Russian soil comes not from Lenin's quill, but from Flaubert's. Resignation is the worst of all virtues. Since, therefore, the military reality principle, and with it the entire rationality of previous calculi for self-preservation, is on the point of dissolving before our eyes in a shocking way, we can ask whether the spiritual resources of our civilization will suffice to erect a new trans-military and post-industrial reality principle. Atomic, biological and chemical weapons, as well as the entire system of hostile artillery, are nothing more than outgrowths of a world historical process of in induration, in which the imperial polemical cultures have represented their essence technically. The overkill realism that lies at the bottom of today's interactions between the great powers can in the long run only be the reality principle of politicking psychopaths. The age of military survival rationality, 
together with all its corollaries, is gradually moving towards a fatal end. But is what is dying here not already pregnant with a new reason? If survival as a whole in the future in no way can be subsumed under the law of warring and exploitative, callous systems, does this not foreshadow a new reality principle? The world situation itself puts our survival in the hands of another ratio. We can no longer pay the price for survival within the framework of the polemical reality principle. The principle of self-preservation is on the point of a world historical overthrow that leads all in duration and armaments ab absurdum. That is the twilight of the idols of cynicism. The hour has come for hard subjects, hard facts, hard politics and hard business. Cultures that have armed themselves with nuclear weapons are being caught in the feedback of their arming. Those who control the splitting of the atom can no longer afford not to control the splitting of humanity. The systematic self-hardening through making enemies. For this reason I have designated the nuclear bomb as the Buddha machine of our civilization. It stands facing us imperturbably and sovereignly as a mute guarantor of negative illuminations. In it, the ontological maximum of our defensivity on a technical path has gained representation. It embodies the extreme to which the armed subjectivity of our rationality of induration was able to develop. If we do not learn from it to create soft facts by means of a new reality, of a new principle of reality and rationality, it could be that in the near future the hard facts will see to our downfall. In it, the ontological maxim of our defensivity on a technical path has gained representation. It embodies the extreme to which the armed subjectivity of our rationality of induration was able to develop. If we do not learn to create from it soft facts by means of a new principle of reality and rationality, it could be that in the near future the hard facts will see to our downfall.